hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Some of you maybe have heard the cell phone ad that uses those words. But these are words that I hear coming from this scripture this morning. We seem to be asking this of God all the time, especially in our dark and fearful times. You know, it's rarely when we're celebrating that we, when our careers are on track and we're, our health is good, that we, we call on God or we question God's presence with us. And in this passage from Exodus, I hear these words. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? If we look at what the Israelites have witnessed in the earlier books of this chapter, they have witnessed plagues and then the miraculous escape as they pass on the dry bed of water held aloft by Moses and his rod. God has called them and led them out and we may think them to be, well, kind of like whiny children. <laughs> You know, are we there yet? I'm hungry. He's touching me. I'm thirsty. Like children in the back of a van on a long family trip. I can tell some of you have heard this before. These Israelites. Well, they need to know, they want to know that God is still with them. That this, this treacherous journey is not leading them out into the desert where they will die of thirst. They, they are afraid. Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever wondered <laughs> if God was still with you? Have you traveled to places in your life, maybe at times when you were not sure that there would be food to eat? or there would be water to drink, or, or that there would be a roof over your head, or money to pay the bills. Life after a diagnosis. Life after a relationship ends. Life when your family, your job, when everything seems to be, well, uncertain and on the rocks. We fear, we humans fear, and in our fear we say, is God still with us? Why doesn't God hear my prayers? God, do you still love me? <laughs> now the Israelites in this story, they've been through the ringer. They have seen their lives turn upside down. You know, even in bondage and slavery, it was familiar. And what they've witnessed, these plagues and these miracles, following Moses out of slavery, but to what? God. Are you still with us? It's fear. Fear that they will die in this wilderness. And Moses, who has done what God has told him against his better judgment originally, he's gone up against this mighty foe, this mighty nation, and he's found himself with these whiny ingrates who have been freed from captivity and who now cry, we are thirsty. Have you brought us out of slavery to die in the wilderness? Have you ever been in a similar position? Have you wondered where God was in your life? Maybe you felt abandoned, alone, and shipwrecked on an island that's unfamiliar when your life has changed and you didn't want it to. Have you ever stepped out in faith and realized that even though you thought that you were out there by yourself, God had prepared a way for you. It might not be the way you imagined. Sometimes we let fears get the best of us. But often, when we look around at where we are, we realize that although God didn't cause our, our <laughs> sadness, our darkness, God has let that darkness be used by us to know that he is with us. You know, when when my 21-year-old son, our 21-year-old son, moved back home this past summer, I was really, really glad to see him. Now, he'd been living away from home for a number of years, and it was good to offer him home-cooked food and 
time to talk. But he brought a guest with him, too. <laughs> and I have to tell you, uh, I was not so happy about it. You see, Molly came to live with us. And I'm really afraid of her. In fact, the conditions of her staying with us is that I should never see her. Her meals are to be taken out of my sight. And in our house, it's two stories in a basement. I prefer that she's on another level behind lots of closed doors. Now, I know some of you are thinking I'm a hard-hearted woman and I have no compassion. But let me tell you, Molly is a five-foot-long ball python. Okay. Now, my son says, she's docile and she's sweet. Well, I, I have this long hill, and I think it's kind of a culturally acceptable fear of snakes. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Okay. Right. Once, my son's girlfriend fetched the snake from behind her locked door, locked cage, and was wearing her down the steps to where I was sitting in the living room, blissfully unaware of anything that was about to happen. And they walked in, and I screamed. And they chastised me for scaring Molly. <laughs> Molly tightened up around the girlfriend's neck, and I said, now, you know what? This would not be a problem if you had observed the I don't see the snake rule. Yeah. And this would not be a problem if Molly's not living in my house. So my sons and their girlfriends, they think, and maybe some of you think my fear is kind of silly. It's very, very real to me. It may not be a fear of snakes for some of you, but have you ever been afraid? Think for a minute, what do you fear? You can probably come up with some things. Maybe it's spiders and snakes. Maybe it's fear of the unknown. Maybe it's fear of strangers or unfamiliar settings or places where we think we could be harmed. We fear, we fear death. Even people of faith, people who live with the knowledge of the resurrection, sometimes we're afraid because we don't know what's going to happen exactly. Now, a little fear of death is useful. It keeps us from running out into traffic and, and doing things that put us at risk. And we teach our children a little bit of healthy fear so that they learn to obey rules and, and helps keep them safe in body and mind. Now, I mentioned with the children earlier in my work with you, Mar, that the adults with intellectual developmental disabilities who come to us, I and the staff that I supervise, we, we teach them art skills. And sometimes they're a little afraid. Even the staff sometimes is a little afraid to pick up a paintbrush and put it on canvas. When Back when I was writing my papers to go before the Board of Ordained Ministry, I taught a Bible study that had an art component to it. And I'll have to say that some of the participants one of them sitting right here, he'd never painted before. And I think he was a little afraid to make a mistake when he put that paint on the canvas. But you know what? It's just paint. And if you don't like how it looks when it's finished, it can always be painted over and repurposed. Sometimes it's really hard to, to let go and be creative. You're afraid of what might happen. Barbara Taylor Brown has written a book called Learning to Walk in the Dark, which I recommend. Uh, she writes beautifully, and I've heard her speak as well. She talks in this book about God working not just in the light, which is how we usually associate God with the light, but God also works in the dark. And in this book, she, she, the premise is for us to put aside our fears and our anxieties and explore just what God can teach us when we're in the dark. And we can learn important things about courage, about, about understanding the world in a new way, and about feeling God's presence in our lives, even when we are in dark times. Now she says that step one of learning to walk in the dark is to give up running the show. Next, you sign the waiver that allows you to bump into some things that may frighten you at first. And finally, you ask darkness to teach you what you need to know. Those are some interesting
interesting steps, aren't they? We have problems with each of those steps, some of us do. The hardest one may be the first one, giving up running the show, giving up control, and then allowing ourselves to bump up against things that frighten us, and then looking around to see what, what can I learn from this experience. She goes on to say, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over again so that there is only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Now, these people in the book of Exodus, well, they are looking for something miraculous to happen. God to save them by an act that cannot be explained in everyday terms. Are we still waiting for the miraculous to believe? Sometimes we encounter something that people have called prosperity gospel that says if we have enough faith, then God will come through. But what happens in the dark places when the miracle fails to occur, when the disease wins, when the marriage fails, when the loved one is gone? Is God not with us then. Now, I don't know about you. In fact, I don't know any of you really at all. But I do know that the God of Moses, the God of Israel, the God who became embodied in Christ Jesus, tells us that God will be with us even in those dark places. You know, the beauty of the Trinity in this threefold nature of God we have this God of history who has helped shape the lives of those who come before us. And Christ Jesus who has sacrificed for us, who has been willing to go all in on our behalf so that we might know uncompromising love. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit there with us in the valley. Another writer, Brene Brown, is not a specifically Christian writer, but she writes about the beauty and power of our own vulnerability. It's really hard for a lot of us to be vulnerable, and I, I know it is for me. In her book, The Gift of Imperfection, she says that owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy. The experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. You see, it's in darkness <laughs> that we find out that God has been with us all along. It's not in our own abilities or our own actions that we find God, that we find the truth. It's in letting go of that power and control where we find the true power of learning from the dark times in our lives. And let me tell you, today we are living in a world that is challenged by darkness. It can be a very, very scary place particularly if you live where disease threatens the fabric of your life in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria. The world is a scary place where there is war in Ukraine and Iraq and Syria and Central Africa. And in this country, we bump up against social justice issues all around us. Issues about democracy and corporate power and gender, economic, and race equality, climate change, education, genetically engineered food. All of these things and more can, can be dark places for us, and it's hard to navigate. And we say, we say like the Israelites, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? You know, at the end of the story, Moses names the place for questioning even putting God on trial has taken place. And the place names are not Rose Garden or Easy Street. The place names Massa 
and Meribah. They mean challenged, quarrel, and revolt. Our encounter with God is not always found in a peace that passes all understanding. Sometimes it's a call to see that God does God's best work in the dark. When we encounter our fears and learn that with God by our side, we can get through this too. Now, does that mean that I'll be wearing Molly around my neck anytime soon? <laughs> or welcoming her to snuggle up on the sofa with me while I watch TV? No, probably not. <laughs> but I have made a peace with the fact that for now, she lives in my house. And that my son can make sure that she doesn't get out and get into the heat vents and surprise her. <laughs> Ever. Living with a ball python is a little like living in the dark for me. I really am scared of her. But knowing that, that not only is Molly living in my house, God is living in my house. He's going before me. He's striking the rock when I need water and helping me, helping you, helping us all to find blessing, even in the dark. Even in the dark, we will be able to see what God intends that we find a light, that we are a light, to move forward, to trust that the God of resurrection will also be with us in all the valleys of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.